What's the significance of the FBI's intervention in this last week of the US election campaign in, uh, in the case against Hillary Clinton? If you look at the history of the FBI, it has become effectively America's political police. Uh, and the FBI demonstrated with taking down uh, the former head of the CIA over um, classified information given to his mistress. N almost no one was untouchable. Mm. The FBI is always trying to demonstrate that. No one can resist us. Mm. But Hillary Clinton uh, very conspicuously resisted uh, the FBI's investigation. Uh, so, there's anger, <clears throat> so there's anger within the FBI because it made the FBI look weak. Well, we're, we've published quite a number of different sets of emails. So. Uh, about 33,000 of mm. Clinton's emails where she was Secretary of State. They come from a batch of just over 60,000 emails. In that 60,000 emails, Clinton has kept about half, 30,000, to herself, and we've published about half. Uh, and then there's the Podesta emails we've been publishing. Podesta is Hillary Clinton's primary campaign manager. So there's a, th a thread that runs through all these emails. There is quite a lot of uh, pay, pay for play, as they mm. call it, ta taking, giving access in exchange for money mm. uh, for many different states, uh, individuals and corporations, um, uh, combined with the uh, uh, cover-up of the Hillary Clinton emails while she was Secretary of State, has led to an environment where the pressure on the FBI increases. I mean, the Clinton campaign has said that Russia is behind all of this. It says that Russia has manipulated the campaign and is the source for WikiLeaks and its emails. The Clinton camp has been able to project a kind of neo-McCarthyist hysteria uh, that Russia is responsible yeah. for everything. Hillary Clinton stated multiple times, falsely, that 17 US intelligence agencies had assessed that uh, Russia was uh, uh, the, the source of our publications. Mm. Okay. Uh, that's false. We can say that the Russian government is not the source, yes. Mm. WikiLeaks has been publishing for 10 years. Uh, in that 10 years, we've published 10 million documents, uh, several thousand individual publications, several thousand different sources. Uh, and we have never got it wrong. All the emails that give evidence of access for money and how Hillary Clinton herself benefited from this and how she is benefiting politically are quite extraordinary. I'm, I'm thinking of uh, where the Qatari representative was given five minutes with Bill Clinton for a million dollar uh, check. Um, and many other examples. Can you? Can oh, you Twelve million from Morocco. Uh, Twelve million from for Morocco. Hillary Clinton yeah. to attend. In terms of the foreign policy of the United States, that's where, for me anyway, where the emails are most revealing, where they show the direct connection between Hillary Clinton and the foundation of jihadism of ISIL in in the Middle East. Can you talk something about that? What the, how the emails demonstrate this connection between those who are meant to be fighting the jihadists, ISIL, are actually those who uh, have helped create it. There's an early 2014 email from Hillary Clinton, so not so long after she left Secretary of State, to her campaign manager, John Podesta. 
Uh, that email, it states uh, that ISIL, ISIS, is uh, funded by Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Mm. The governments of Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Now, th this is a, I actually, I think this is the most significant email in the whole collection. Mm. Uh, and perhaps because Saudi and Qatari money is spread um, all over the place, inclu including into many media institutions. All serious analysts know, uh, even the US government uh, has mentioned or, or agreed with that some Saudi figures have been supporting ISIS, funding ISIS. But the dodge has always been that's uh, what well, it's just some rogue princes mm. using their cut of the oil money to mm. do whatever they like, but actually the government disapproves. But that email says that no, it is the governments of Saudi and the government uh, mm. and Qatar uh, that have been funding ISIS. The Saudis, the Qataris, the Moroccans, the Bahrainis, particularly the Saudis and the Qataris, are giving all this money to the Clinton Foundation, uh, while Hillary Clinton is Secretary of, of State and the State Department is approving massive arms sales, particularly to Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Un un under Hillary Clinton, uh, and our Clinton emails uh, reveal uh, a significant discussion about it, uh, the largest ever arms deal in the world was made with Saudi Arabia, more than $80 billion. In, in fact, during her tenure as Secretary of State, total arms uh, exports from the United States in, in terms of the dollar value doubled. Doubled. And, and of course, the consequence of that is that this notorious terrorist jihadist group called ISIL or ISIS uh, is created largely with money from the very people who are giving money to the Clinton Foundation. Yes. That's extraordinary. Look, Hillary Clinton's just a person. Uh, I actually feel quite sorry for Hillary Clinton as a person uh, because I see someone who is um, eaten alive uh, by their ambitions. Tor tormented, uh, literally to the point uh, uh, where they they become sick. You know, they faint as a result of going on and going on with their ambitions. But she represents a whole network of people uh, and a network of relationships also with particular states. The question is, how does Hillary Clinton fit in this broader network? She's a, a centralizing cog, so that you've got a lot of different gears in operation uh, from the big banks like Goldman Sachs and, and major elements of Wall Street and intelligence and people in the State Department and the Saudis and so on. Uh, she's the, if you like, the centralizer that interconnects all these different cogs. She's, sm she's a, a smooth central representation of all that, and all that is more or less uh, what is in power now in the United States. It's what we call the establishment or the, the DC consensus and its influences. Um, in fact, one of the more significant Podesta emails uh, that we released was about how the Obama cabinet was formed. And, and half of the Obama cabinet was basically nominated by a representative from Citibank. Well, it is quite quite amazing. Didn't Citibank supply a list? Which, yes, which turned out to be which most turned of, out to, to be most the Obama cabinet. Yes. So Wall Street decides the cabinet of the president of the United States. But if you were following the Obama cam campaign back then closely, you could see uh, it had become very close uh, to banking interests. It wasn't so close to oil interests, but it was very close to banking interests. Yeah. yeah. So I think you can't under, properly understand Hillary Clinton's foreign policy without understanding Saudi Arabia. The connections with Saudi Arabia are so intimate. Why was she so demonstrably enthusiastic about the destruction of Libya? Can you talk a little about 
just what the emails have told us, told you about what happened there, because Libya is such a source for so much of the mayhem now in Syria, the ISIL, jihadism, and so on. And it was almost Hillary Clinton's invasion. What, what do the emails tell us about that? Libya, more than anyone else's war, was Hillary Clinton's war. Uh, Barack Obama initially opposed it. Mm. Who was the person who was championing it? Hillary Clinton. That's documented uh, throughout uh, her emails. Uh, she had she put her her favoured agent in effect, Sidney Blumenthal, uh, onto that. Uh, there's more than 1,700 emails out of the 33,000 Hillary Clinton emails we publish just about Libya. It's not about that Libya has cheap oil. She perceived the. Um, the removal of Gaddafi uh, and the overthrow of the Libyan state, something that she would use to run in the general election for president. So late 2011, there's <clears throat> an internal document called the, the Libya TikTok uh, mm -hmm. that is produced for Hillary Clinton. Uh, and it's all the, it's a chronological description of how Hillary Clinton was the central figure in the destruction of the Libyan state. Uh, as a result, um, uh, there was around uh, 40,000 deaths uh, within Libya. Jihadists moved in, ISIS moved in. That led to the European refugee and migrant crisis because not only did you have people fleeing Libya, people then fleeing Syria, uh, destabilization of other African countries as a result of arms flows, the Libyan state itself uh, was no longer able to control movement of people through it. Uh, so um, the Mediterranean, Libya faces onto the Mediterranean. And so it had been effectively the cork in the bottle of Africa. So all problems, economic problems, civil war in Africa, previously people fleeing those problems didn't end up in Europe because Libya policed uh, the Mediterranean. And that was said explicitly at the time, uh, back in early 2011 by Gaddafi. What do these Europeans think that they, they're doing trying to um, bomb and destroy the Libyan state? There's going to be uh, floods uh, of migrants out of Africa and jihadists into Europe, and that is exactly what happened. You get a lot of complaints um, from people saying, what is WikiLeaks doing? Are they trying to put Trump in the White House? My analysis is that Trump would not be permitted to win. Uh, why do I say that? Because he's had every establishment offside. Trump doesn't have one establishment, maybe with the exception of the evangelicals, if you can call them an establishment. But uh, banks, in, intelligence, uh, arms companies, well, they all want him beat foreign money, etc., yeah. is all united uh, beh behind Hillary Clinton. Mm. And, uh, and the media as well. Mm. Uh, so media owners uh, and even journalists themselves. The accusations that WikiLeaks is in league with the Russians, um, and you hear people saying, well, <clears throat> why doesn't WikiLeaks uh, investigate and publish emails on Russia? We have published over 800,000 uh, documents of various kinds uh, that relate to Russia. Mm. Uh, most of those are critical. Uh, most of those are critical. And, uh, a great many books have come out of our publications about Russia, most of which are critical, uh, and our documents have gone on to be used in quite a number of uh, court cases, uh, refugee cases of people fleeing some kinds of claimed political persecution in Russia, which they use our documents to back up. Do you take your, yourself a view of the US election? Uh, do you have a preference for... Clinton or Trump? Donald Trump 
what does he represent in the American mind and in the European mind? He represents American white trash. Deplorable and irredeemable. Basically the same thing. It, it means from a, from a establishment or educated, cosmopolitan, urbane perspective, these people are, you know, they're, they're, they're like the rednecks and, and you can't, like they're just, you can never deal with them. Um, and because he, because he so clearly, uh, through his words and actions and the type of people turns up his rallies, uh, represent represents people who are not the middle, not the upper middle class educated. Yeah. Um, there's a fear of seeming to be associated in any way with that, a social fear that lowers the class status of anyone who can be accused uh, of somehow assisting in any way Trump, including by criticizing Clinton. Yeah. And, that, and if you look at how the middle class uh, uh, gains its economic and social power, it, it makes absolute sense. I'd like to talk about Ecuador, a small country that has given you refuge and given you asylum in this embassy in London. Now, Ecuador cut off the internet from here, where we're doing this interview, in the embassy, for the clearly obvious reason that they were concerned about appearing to intervene in the US election campaign. Can you talk about why they would take that action and your own views on Ecuador's support for you? Let's, let's go back four years ago, right. Ecuador. Uh, I made an asylum application to Ecuador in this embassy uh, because of the US uh, extradition case. Yeah. Uh, and the result uh, was after a month, we, I was successful uh, in asylum application. And then the embassy has been surrounded by police. Mm. Uh, quite an expensive uh, police operation, which the British government admits to spending uh, more than uh, 12.6 million pounds. They admitted that uh, over a year ago. Uh, and now there's undercover police and there's robot uh, surveillance cameras of various kinds. So that there has been a uh, quite serious uh, conflict right here in the heart of London mm. uh, between Ecuador, a country of 16 million people, and the United Kingdom and the Americans who have been helping on the side. So but that was a, a brave and principled thing for Ecuador to do. Mm. Uh, now we have the US election on foot. The Ecuadorian election is in February uh, next year. Uh, you have um, the White House feeling uh, the political heat uh, as a result of the true information that we have been publishing. Mm. WikiLeaks does not publish from the jurisdiction of Ecuador, mm -hmm. from this embassy or in the territory of Ecuador. Mm -hmm. We publish from France, we publish from, from Germany, we publish from uh, the Netherlands uh, and a number of other countries. So that the attempted squeeze on WikiLeaks is through my refugee status. And this, this is really intolerable mm -hmm. if you try and get at a publishing organization mm -hmm. to try and prevent it publishing true information uh, that is of intense interest to the American people and others uh, mm. about an election. Tell us what would happen if you walked out of this embassy. So I would be immediately arrested uh, by the British police mm. and I would then uh, be extradited either immediately uh, to the United States or to Sweden. Mm. Uh, in Sweden I am not charged. I've already been previously cleared, etc. Yeah. So we're not certain exactly what would happen there, but then we know that the Swedish government has refused uh, to say that they will not extradite me to the United States. Uh, and they have extradited 100% of people that the US has requested mm -hmm. since at least 2000. So over the last 15 years, every single person the US has tried to extradite 
from Sweden has been extradited and they refuse to provide a guarantee. So it's, yeah. I mean, people often ask how you cope with the isolation here. Look, one of the best attributes of human beings is that they are adaptable. One of the worst attributes of human beings is they are adaptable. Hmm? They adapt and start to tolerate abuses. Hmm. They adapt to being involved themselves in abuses. They adapt to adversity and continue on. Uh, so in my situation, frankly, I'm a bit institutionalized. This is, this is the world. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, visually, this is the world. Uh, it's the world without sunlight, for one thing, isn't it? It's a world without sunlight, but I haven't seen sunlight in so long. Like, I don't remember yeah. it. So, yeah, you, you adapt. The one real irritant uh, is that my young children, uh, mm. they also adapt. Mm. They, adapt to, they adapt to being without their father. That's a, mm. a hard, hard adaption, which they didn't ask for. Do you worry about them? Yeah, I worry about them. I worry about their mother. Yeah. Some people would say, well, why don't you end it and simply walk out the door and allow yourself to be extradited to Sweden? Uh, the UN has looked into this whole situation. They spent 18 months uh, in formal uh, adversarial litigation, me at the UN mm. versus Sweden and the UK. Who's right? The UN made a conclusion, I'm being arbitrarily detained, illegally yeah. deprived of my freedom, that, that what has been uh, occurred has not occurred uh, within the laws that the United Kingdom and Sweden must obey. Mm. It's a, it is an illegal abuse. United Nations formally asking mm. what's going on here? What's your legal explanation for this? He says that you should be, you should recognize his asylum. Mm. Sweden formally writing back to United Nations says, no, we're not going, we're not going to. Mm -hmm. So leaving open their ability to extradite. I, I find, I just find it absolutely amazing that the that the narrative about this situation is not put out publicly in the press yeah. Yeah, because it, it doesn't suit the Western establishment narrative that yes, the West has political prisoners. It's a reality. It's not just me. There's a bunch of other people as well. Yeah. The West has political prisoners. No state ex accepts to call the people it is imprisoning or detaining for political reasons, political prisoners. They don't call them political prisoners in China. They don't call them political prisoners in Azerbaijan, and they don't call them uh, political prisoners uh, in the United States, UK, or Sweden. It's absolutely intolerable to have that kind of uh, self-perception. But here we have a case, talking about the Swedish case, where I have never been charged with a crime, where I have already been cleared and found to be innocent, where the woman herself said that the police made it up, where the United Nations formally said the whole thing is illegal, where the state of Ecuador also investigated and found that I should be given asylum. Those are, those are the facts. And, mm. But what is the rhetoric? Mm. Different. The, the, the rhetoric is pretending, constantly pretending that I have been charged with a crime, never mentioning that I have been pre already previously cleared, mm. never mentioning that the woman herself says that the police made it up, trying to avoid that the UN formally found that the whole thing is illegal. Never even mentioning that Ecuador made a formal assessment through its formal processes and found that, uh, yes, I am uh, subject to persecution by the United mm. States. thousand to herself and we have published about half uh, and then there's the Podesta emails we have been publishing Podesta is Hillary Clinton's 
primary campaign manager. So there's a, th a thread that runs through all these emails. There is uh, quite a lot of uh, pay, pay for play, as they call it, ta taking, giving access in exchange for money uh, for many different states, uh, individuals and corporations, um, uh, combined with the uh, uh, cover-up of the Hillary Clinton emails while she was Secretary of State has led to an environment where the pressure on the FBI increases. I mean, the Clinton campaign has said that Russia is behind all of this. It says that Russia has manipulated the campaign and is the source for WikiLeaks and its emails. The Clinton camp has been able to project a kind of neo-McCarthyist hysteria. What's the significance of the FBI's intervention in this last week of the US election campaign in, uh, in the case against Hillary Clinton? If you look at the history of the FBI, it has become effectively America's political police. Uh, and the FBI demonstrated with taking down uh, the former head of the CIA over um, classified information given to his mistress. N almost no one was untouchable. Mm. The FBI is always trying to demonstrate that. No one can resist us. Mm. But Hillary Clinton uh, very conspicuously resisted uh, the FBI's investigation. Uh, so, there's anger, <clears throat> so there's anger within the FBI because it made the FBI look weak. Well, we're, we've published quite a number of different sets of emails. So. Uh, about 33,000 of mm. Clinton's emails where she was Secretary of State. They come from a batch of just over 60,000 emails. In that 60,000 emails, Clinton has kept about half. 30 Representative was given five minutes with Bill Clinton for a million dollar uh, check. Um, and many other examples. Can you... Can oh, you 12 million for Morocco. Uh, 12, 12 million from for Morocco Hillary Clinton yeah. to attend. In terms of the foreign policy of the United States, that's where, for me anyway, where the emails are most revealing, where they show the direct connection between Hillary Clinton and the foundation of jihadism of ISIL in, in the Middle East. Can you talk something about that? What the, how the emails demonstrate this connection between those who are meant to be fighting the jihadists, ISIL, are actually those who uh, have helped create it. There's an early 2014 email from Hillary Clinton, so not so long after she left Secretary of State, to her career, uh, that Russia is responsible yeah. for everything. Hillary Clinton stated multiple times, falsely, that 17 US intelligence agencies had assessed that uh, Russia was uh, uh, the, the source of our publications. Mm. Okay. Uh, that's false. We can say that the Russian government is not the source, yes. Mm. WikiLeaks has been publishing for 10 years. Uh, in that 10 years, we've published 10 million documents, uh, several thousand individual publications, several thousand different sources. Uh, and we have never got it wrong. All the emails that give evidence of access for money and how Hillary Clinton herself benefited from this and how she is benefiting politically are quite extraordinary. I'm, I'm thinking of uh, where the Qatari